have to work. We are starting, or we have started a new concept called line integrals. And it's, line integrals is kind of a, a strange term because you're never going to be on a line. That's not even interesting. So <clears throat> I said on the first day of class, the entire point of this class was to do the following problem. I have a wheelbarrow full of stuff. And I'm going to move that wheelbarrow around the campus. Let's say I'm going up hills and down hills, you know, and moving never on a line. I'm moving around a curve, not a surface, a curve. I have a path in three dimensions. Okay? How much work did I get done moving that wheelbarrow? So well, that's not too hard. Oh, but while I'm moving the wheelbarrow, it's kind of bumpy and things are falling out. And there's a torrential downpour and there's leaks all over the place. So in other words, the amount of weight that I'm pushing is changing <laughs> consistently. So I have variable force along a curve. Does that sound scary? That one problem right there, that is the entire point of Calculus 3. And we will be able to answer that question in the next few days. And it won't be that complicated. But this is the concept of a line integral. As I'm moving on a curve, I'm integrating along the curve. It's not arc length. At every point on the curve, think of it as I'm applying a different force. So the question is, how much work did I get done in the end? Now, the funny part is the textbooks never bring up work. Not for a while. Later on, they'll say, oh yeah, by the way, all this time you've been finding work. Now, I'm going to tell you that right now. You're integrating force along a path. Force times distance is work. It's like, why would you not say work on the first day you're doing this? None of the textbooks bring up work until maybe the third day you're doing this. And, <laughs> what am I finding? Are you finding work? That's the only thing you're ever finding in these situations here. So that's the concept of a line integral. So before we do that, there's a couple of operators that I'm going to introduce. We're not using them heavily today. I'm introducing them. They're going to be really important at the end of this chapter, but we will use them periodically throughout the way. So I've got a vector. Let's call it... Um, This is kind of the universal notation. So we generally just write it like this. Oops. M and P. We save ourselves trouble. In Calc 1, when you wrote Y, you never wrote Y of X. That was implied. But if it was Y of T, you really needed to write that. Right? To indicate there was a different variable. When we write M, N, and P, it's implied that each one of these are functions of x, y, and z. That doesn't mean I have to have an x, y, and z in each statement, but I can potentially have x, y's, and z's. So we write it this way, just because that takes a really long time. But it's understood that each one of these are a function of x, y, and z. This would be a force in 3D, or, because sometimes we're going to be working in 2D, then we will be doing this problem. And both are relevant, OK? Because sometimes I'm moving only on the floor. Uh, there isn't going to be anything Z, and that's okay. So the first thing we're going to define is something called the divergence. This one is easy. The divergence of F, which we usually write it like this, div F. The divergence of F, first of all, is a scalar valued function. Okay, It is not a vector. Everything we've done is either going to produce vectors or scalar valued functions. Now, why don't I say scalar? Well, because it's not going to be a number. It's probably going to be a function of x, y, or z. It's not going to be a number until I evaluate that at some particular place. And sometimes we forget that. Uh, most of calculus involves functions. Right? We don't like it in Calc 1 when we were dealing with circles and things like that because they're not functions. They're harder to work with. But most everything we did involved functions. We look at the domains of our functions. But we don't get scalars until we evaluate our functions. That's what's called a scalar valued function. Upon evaluation, you get a scalar. And so the, the question most people ask at this point, well, wouldn't all functions be scalar valued functions? Actually, no. Most functions are not scalar valued functions. Because most functions of multiple variables, most functions of multiple variables, you can only evaluate one value at a time. All of statistics is based on this. Oh, so I have a function of multiple variables, but I only get to evaluate one of the variables at a time. There's no ordered n-tuples in statistics. You're holding one thing or only moving one thing at a time. Everything else is held fixed, like a partial derivative. 
Uh, so I have a function of multiple variables. Now let's evaluate it at x equals 3. Now it's going to be a function of all the other variables. <laughs> Does that make sense? That's not a scalar value function because I'm never going to get a scalar out of that one. A scalar value function is one that when I evaluate it, I will always get a scalar, which means that when we evaluate these, we evaluate them at order of n tuples, order of pairs, order of triples, so on. That, all of math doesn't work that way. In fact, none of statistics works that way. Okay, when you have the higher levels, you realize that. Now, for our practical purposes, there's never going to be a, a, a thing you're, you're going to struggle with. Okay, so this is a scalar value function, so it's probably going to have x's, y's, and or z's, or could actually be a number. And the way it works is, we go back to the del operator. Okay, the del operator is defined to be the op oops, the operator of partial derivatives. I'm going to do the 3D case, but the same will be true in 2D. This is not a value. This is an instruction. Okay. These are derivative instructions, and this thing here is applied to, I have some function f of x, y, and z. Okay. When I did the del operator and I applied it to something, what did I get? You remember? What was the word called? Gradient. The gradient. And it was a vector of partial derivatives. Everybody, everybody cool with that? Oh yeah, I already know that. Okay, it's a vector of partial derivatives. This is an operator that produced a vector. So when I did <coughs> del, I don't say del dot f, I just say del of f, we know that was then, now I'll, I'll write this way, fx, fy, fz. Okay, that was practical, we've used this. But what if I have this and I have this? How would I do a, a vector of partial derivatives applied to another vector? Well, if I think a vector applied to another vector, what can I do? There's two things I can do. I can do a dot or a cross product. Ah, and those are the two things we're going to define. So if I said take the del and dot it with the f, if I take the operator and dot it, what will I get? I will get this plus this plus this. This really isn't abstract. This is very applied. If I say del dotted with f, I will get this summation. And this is called the divergence of f. Okay? Amen. Take that outside if you got text inside a classroom in anywhere in the state of California, unless it's an emergency. And put your phones away. <laughs> yeah. You do know that. It's against the law in the state of California. So I'm good on there. Legally, I, they actually tell me I'm supposed to confiscate your stuff. I would never do that in a million years. Just put it away. <laughs> Go outside. This is a scalar value function. Okay? Right now, it's done. It, it, it just, it's it. It fizzled out. We did it. We moved on. We don't have a use for this yet. We're going to use this in the last day. This is the last lecture we use. Use this to answer humongous calculus questions. So this is really important later. Right now, it's just a simple, simple exercise. The, the bigger of the two, though, is the one where we talk about it as a cross. Now, I can do the divergence on a two-dimensional vector. No problem. But I can't do a cross product on a two-dimensional vector. So that's only defined in 3D. So the second one we define is something called the curl of f. Now this one's a little bit trickier, okay? The curl of f is defined as del cross f. But how do I do a cross product? Again, these are operators, these are not values. But I still do first thing applied to second thing and so on. But as a cross product, that means my result is a vector, okay? And there's a really easy way that I do this, that I, I just never get in trouble this way. I'm going to do the cross product of this thing crossed with this thing. So first of all, if I do that, then my answer's, oh, I will, right, right here. Um, whether you use this notation or subscript notation, it doesn't make any difference. Most of you probably prefer the subscript notation because it does, doesn't take as long to write. I, I'm a big fan of that. It's, but be careful. I, I see a lot of people doing stuff like this all the time. 
In Calc 1, in fact, maybe algebra. Do you know what this means 100% of the time in every class before this? It meant f of x, they were just sloppy and didn't write the parentheses. But in Calc 3, they mean that. <laughs> Never make your x as big as the thing that it follows because it's a subscript. A lot of you write your x as the exact same size. That, that's kind of like, I want two, to, two raised to the x power. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, you know, I think most people would be confused by that if I, if I wanted that to be an exponent. So I like the subscript notation, just make it look like subscripts. So if I do that, then this becomes PY minus NZ, and then what do we get? PX minus MZ, and then NX minus MY. Okay. Oh, how can I do that easily? This is what I do. I'm lazy. This is how I always do the curl. I never do it any other way but this. I simply write the partials over the terms. Right? Boom, 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 boom. <laughs> so taking the curl should take seconds, or you can do your whole determinant setup, write it out, take a high, take you know 25 minutes, and then guarantee that you're going to get it incorrect. Yeah, I, I laugh at this. Even in Calc 3 at this point, still at least 50% of all cross products are incorrect that we get, but these cannot be checked quite so easily because you're not getting numbers, you're getting functions. So, yeah, you, know, you want to get it right. This is curl. Now, what is curl? Right now, it does, it's just a thing that we get as a result, but the easiest analogy I can give you and the easiest way I can kind of suggest where it can come from, my favorite is the riverboat. How many know what a riverboat is? Well, how is a riverboat propelled exactly? Usually sea paddles. They have a big old paddle wheel. You guys ever seen those you know, in the old movies? They have a huge paddle wheel behind the thing, and it turns, and that's how it, it moves around. Okay, so now think the paddle wheel. Now, an easier way to think about it, I'm gonna put a circular cylinder and put the paddle wheel in this way, so it's gonna go like this. Okay, the curl vector tells me something about the rotational energy being created and so on. The curl vector can be the zero vector. In fact, we really like it in real life when it is the zero vector. Good things happen to us. We, we actually like that problem. But it's, it has to do with, with rotational stuff in general, which is why they use the word curl. You don't see anything here that even suggests circular motion. This isn't circular motion. But if my motion is circular motion, then certain really good things happen. Okay, So that's the curl. Now, can we use curl right now to help us with certain things? Yes, we can, okay? So in the last part of the lecture from Friday, I talked about potential functions, okay? Can anybody tell me what's a potential function? Ooh, yeah, you probably should have, should have watched that. Yeah, what's a potential function? Potential function is any function of two or three variables is a potential function. Anything you can write down is, a, is potentially a potential function. But the thing is you don't ever use your potential function. You use the gradient of your potential function. And that is your force vector. So I have some potential function f of x, y, z. I'll do things in 3D for right now. Okay, but a lot of these you can also do in 2D. Then we're going to define big F to be the gradient of little f. And if I take the gradient of a potential function, then this vector is the most important word you've learned in this entire semester so far. If you watch the video, I'm serious, this is the single most important word in all of Calc 3, and it's probably the most important word in physics related to math. Conservative. Conservative. That is not as opposed to liberal. <laughs> that has to do with energy and things like that. This vector is conservative if it is the gradient of a potential function. That's why you have to know what that is. A conservative vector is a good thing. We like conservative vectors. Conservative vectors make mathematics way simpler. Even, it still might be complicated, but it won't be nearly as complicated. And I talked about that whole moving the wheelbarrow around campus. So I just made a big loop all the way around campus and I ended up where I started. That's a lot of work. And we're gonna learn how to calculate that one later on, the big loop one. That's, that's what Green's theorem is on Wednesday. 
But if my force was conservative, then how much work did I get done if I end up where I started? Zero. Zero. That's why conservative is so important. By the way, conservative is rare. It's not the rule of thumb. It's rare to be conservative. But if a force is conservative, then displacement is the only thing that matters. And that's why we want to know that's good. A lot of folks say, well, if you end up where you start, it's always zero. No, it's almost never zero. Like, like one out of a bazillion is zero. But if it's conservative, that's the whole conservation of energy thing. That's where that comes from. Oh, okay. So it only has to do with displacement. That's something we're going to learn over the next couple of days. So I create a conservative vector. I don't know what to do with that, but I do know it's conservative. Now, if I said everybody here, just, just make up a vector either in 2D or 3D. Just make up anything. You know, okay, sine x, comma, y squared, comma, x, z. You know, just keep it simple. If everybody, in fact, everyone make up 10 vectors. Do you think any of them are going to be conservative? It's probably not. You're making them up. You didn't calculate them. You, you just made up a vector. Well, if I start with a potential function, and then that, the reason it's called a potential function is I created a force vector from that function. That's what makes it a potential function. All functions can be potential functions if you create a vector from them. I'm going to give you a vector. Is there a way to know if it's conservative? Because if it is, then one of our goals, this is, uh, I think, actually, yeah, it's tomorrow's class. One of our goals is, if I give you a vector, A, first of all, determine is it conservative, and if it is conservative, can you tell me exactly what the potential function it came from? Because that's extremely useful and valuable. Ooh, so, boy, that's, that's kind of tricky. All right, well, let's look at something. I have, I just created this thing here. So in my picture here, that's the M, that's the N, that's the P, correct? Anybody see that? Because you have, you have a vector of functions. You don't have a vector of letters. You're not writing M, N, and P. You're just calling whatever the first one is M, the second one N, and the third one P. I would like you to take, or I'd like everybody here to find the curl of this vector right here, of that capital F. On your own, take a moment. Good, it's good, good practice. And by the way, you can leave it in these terms. That would probably be wise. Remember, you cannot take the curl of a two-dimensional vector because a curl is basically a version of cross product. So tell me when you get an answer. So when I, I put my, I just draw my partial right over the vector, or right over the terms themselves. And I don't say it jokingly. This is how I've always done it, because I am lazy. I want to get two goals. You want to be right, and you want to know that you're right. And I don't say that jokingly. I taught remedial algebra for years. You guys have never done this, but you probably know some disreputable snipe who has. They took a test, and then they changed right answers into wrong answers. You've, you've heard of this happening, haven't you? You would never have done this yourself, agreed? But you've heard of this. Why would any human being change a right answer into a wrong answer? Because they wanted to bring themselves back down to the rest of the group because they thought maybe you know, they're you know, looking too good. Right? That's why you make mistakes at work, so you can you know, make everyone else feel better. Right? Or no? Do you think anybody's ever actually gone back and changed right answers to wrong answers on purpose? No. Why would any human being change a right answer to a wrong answer? Because they didn't know. Which one was right? They didn't know they were right. <laughs> and if you don't know that you're right, your right answer actually is a guess. So I always would tell the students, there's two points to every problem. Be right and know you're right. Because if you know you're right, you're not going to change it. You have absolute certainty and you move on. That's confidence. But if you have a right answer and you don't know you're right, you're going to change it. Because really it was a guess. So you have to have a reason. Okay, I know it's right because I know I did all the things. So if I say, Christian, explain to me why you think that's the right answer. You go, because this, 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 this. I go, great. Or, I have no idea, I was just winging it. <laughs> well, that, that probably wouldn't work, would it? Occasionally do we get lucky? Sure, but probably unlucky more often than not. So, I'm going to ask the question, how, you know, how do I know? Well, does anybody have an answer, by the way? 
Anybody finish this? Hopefully you did. F of zy minus f of yz. Okay, which is what? Zero. Oh, and what was the next one? Zero. And the next one? Really? Wait, when you took the curl of this vector, you got the zero vector? That's crazy. Or is that really good? Yeah, this is it. This is how you determine if a vector is conservative. It's as simple as this. If the curl of the vector is the zero vector, then your vector was conservative. That's it. If it's not the zero vector, then it's not conservative. Oh, well that, that sounds kind of easy, doesn't it? So if I start with a potential function, I get this. If I take the curl of this, you're right. All of the things are going to cancel in every position. Because they're all going to be second order cross partials of the other letter of the alphabet in the sense. So that's going to be yz minus yz. That's going to be xz minus xz. And that's going to be xy minus xy. That's what you should have noticed. So if I give you a, if I just made up a random vector, how would I know if it's conservative? I find its curl. Now, by the way, the curl of that vector is something we use to answer other questions later on. That's the second to last lecture. That's something called Stokes' theorem, that where we actually use the curl of the vector to answer a question. But if the curl of the vector is the zero vector, ooh, that means the answer to the question is probably going to be zero. So we actually like that. Okay. So the only test that exists to determine if something's conservative is to take the curl of it, which is actually a fairly simple process. Now. Next day, tomorrow, what we're going to do is, if I give you a vector and you've determined that it is actually conservative, we're going to learn how to work backwards to find the potential function. What do you suppose that involves? Anybody? Derivative? Derivative? Partial derivative? Or well, partial derivative is how I got the vector. So probably have to integrate. I probably have to integrate going backwards. But I probably have to integrate more than once. So it's actually a process. It's not a trivial process. It's, it's a bit of work, but the results are huge because I can use them to answer, well, I can take complicated questions and perhaps make them easier. Conservative vector, always better. So let's do a real simple example. Let's say I'm going to give you an f um, 2x cubed sine y um, e to the x, z, and then 3x squared, z cubed. Let's find, just good exercise, let's find the divergence of f, and let's find the curl of f. And that's usually how we write it. You don't need uh, parentheses like function notation. This is kind of a universal way of writing this. So the first one's going to be a function, scalar value function. The second one's going to be a vector. And both of these should be relatively simple because all you're doing, like Christian said, you're just taking partial derivatives. You just don't go too fast. Let's see what we get. We have started what is generally called vector calculus. I'm sure most of you have heard that term, but you're not really sure. You said, well, what did we do at the start of the course? That, that's the irony. That what we did at the start of the course was the calculus of vectors. We're doing something completely unrelated. We don't even cross paths with what we did at the beginning. This is called vector calculus. So if you were looking in any course outline you know, at a university or something, and they'll say, you know, vector calculus, that's what the remaining lectures are dealing with, line integrals in general and things of that nature. Because everything's about vectors, but from a different point of view. Uh, and a lot of this, again, involves motion like we learned earlier, but we're doing a little more complicated stuff. So all the stuff we did at the beginning will help us at the end. But the stuff we did at the beginning, the first few lectures, remember, that wasn't even calculus yet. OK, so what do we have for divergence, anybody? <coughs> so what do we got? 6x squared sine y. Zero, good. That's it. Do I set this equal to zero? Do I factor? Do I do anything? No. Um, a lot of folks love factoring this. I, I'm never going to discourage you from factoring something. But you're never, did I lose something? It should be nine, not six. Oh, okay. And the new math. Yeah, nine. I would never discourage you from you know, factoring out the x squared. 
but you're never going to set the divergence equal to zero. So a factored answer really isn't of any help from that standpoint. What you are going to do with this quantity at some point, you're actually going to integrate this quantity. And if I'm going to integrate this quantity, do I want it in a factored form for the purposes of integration? Eh, probably not. I think integrating something that's factored is not helpful. I think you want it, you would want, if I gave you, you know, a product of something and I said factor, you say, I probably should multiply it out first. It might be easier. So leave it alone. Now the second one, So zero what's this one to be? What's my chain rule factor? X. It's easier if we write it in front. Zero six x c cubed. Negative six x c cubed. Don't lose our signs. cubed cos y. Beautiful. Okay. Unfortunately, I don't have a way really of checking this. Isn't the middle one supposed to be positive? Did I mess that up? The p with respect to x and then the x. Well, let's see. So we went boom, boom. Then we went boom, boom. So no, that should be negative. And then boom, boom. No, that the, okay. yeah. <laughs> that's the one. That's the one we're most likely to mess up, isn't it? It's that little one. So it's a, this was just an exercise. There's there's nothing about this answer that we're going to do with. Okay. Oh, but you can tell me something about f. It's not conservative. It's not conservative. Beautiful. Um, and that's probably the best. You know, everything you work with is probably the case. Which means I'm going to use it. I'm going to answer questions. I'm going to do stuff. And I don't have the advantage of conservative. But that's okay. We'll learn all the math that we need. But understanding that if something is conservative. That definitely makes certain processes simpler, but not everything. See, if I said move it from point A to point B and it's conservative, I still have to do something. But let me tell you right now, here's why it's important. Okay? I gotta get from point A to point B, and, and I found out I have a conservative force. So I can take my wheelbarrow, and over here, um, there's barbed wire and landmines and and, and spiders. <sighs> Lots of spiders on this path. But on this path, there's like flowers and gumdrops and butterflies and things like that. And both paths end up merging at the same point on the other side. And I need to get it from here to there. If my vector is conservative, guess what? It doesn't matter. In fact, it wouldn't matter what path I take. It only matters where you start and where you finish. So the only thing that matters in a conservative vector is your displacement overall. Ooh, so I don't need to go barbed wire path, I can go gumdrop butterfly path and I'll still get the same final answer. That's why it's so important to understand the nature of conservative that we say it, this is tomorrow's lecture, it's path independent. It only matters where I begin and where I end. And that's, that's cool, you like that. That makes the math so much easier. But again, you have no control over whether a vector is conservative, your goal is just to discover it. So now, let's start talking about a line integral. Okay, so I'm gonna do all of this in two dimensions because the mathematics in two and the mathematics in three are not different. I'm gonna be integrating over a path, but it's easier for me to represent it in 2D because I can't really draw you a curve in 3D. We've, we've talked about that one before, okay? So I'm gonna go, let's say from here to here. And I, I do need to give you a direction. So clearly I started on the left, I ended on the right. I could have gone the other way. And it does matter, okay? Let's say this is, this curve is f of x, y. Not f of x, there's an f of x, y. Every point on the curve, now the curve, I'm sorry, the curve is not f of x, y. f of x, y is what I'm evaluating at every point on the curve, okay? So at every point on the curve, I'm gonna have a different f of x, y. 
we call the path, we usually just call it C for curve. It's kind of boring. I have to tell you, this path might say, okay, you're moving along a sine wave, or you're moving along a parabola, or you're moving along a line. You, you have to be told what the curve is. There's no ambiguity whatsoever. I'm giving you very, very specific, here's the equation that governs the curve, piece of cake. But this is the thing that I'm integrating. A line integral is, has three forms right now. We put the C to indicate I'm integrating along the C. Then I'm going to define C very well. And it's going to be f of x, y, dx. Or it's f of x, y, dy. Or our least favorite, it's f of x, y, ds. So the first one I'm only integrating along x, the second one I'm only integrating along y, and the third one I'm integrating along what? Arc the arc length. We don't like the third one as much because the third one can produce integrations that are very difficult. So what we do in each case is we parameterize the curve. So what I'm going to do, I have a C. And I'm going to change x to a function of t. I'm going to change y to a function of t. So now my integral is just a function of t. And I'm going to integrate with respect to t. Does that make sense? Oh, OK, because I want a numerical answer. I don't want a function. I want a number. I'm going to do the same thing here, but it's not going to give me the same answer because dy and dx are not the same thing. There's only one situation where dy and dx will ever be the same. I'm moving along the line, y equals x. <laughs> and that's it. That is the only time they'll ever be the same. But the third one, ooh, I got to parameterize, and then ds, that's the arc length parameter. That's the dx dt squared plus dy dt squared under the square root. That's why I'm saying that one might produce an ickier integral often. Okay, so I want to take it through the entire problem from beginning to end, and I'll use something that's fairly simple. And I have this in the in the posted videos also. I, I use this particular example because it's easy to get through. So let's suppose, here's what we're going to do. We're going to move along, um, And, or actually, let's just say, I'm going to, let's do top half. Now, the reason the arrow is important, that means I'm starting here and I'm ending here. Do you think it might be different if I did it the other way around? If I started on the left and ended on the right, might things be different? What do you suppose would be the biggest difference? Yeah, my final answer would probably be the opposite sign. If I said, what's the work that I need to go from here to there, and I'm calling that the positive direction, then going from there to here should be the opposite sign. Oh, because it's a dot product. Direction matters. Angle, right? Now I'd be taking the cosine of 180 degrees, that kind of thing. So if I reverse the direction, that should change the sign of the answer. So that's why, now, as a simple rule of thumb that we pretty much always follow in math, Whenever you're doing something involving angles, we generally always consider the positive direction where the angles are increasing. See, in other words, if that's an angle of zero, then I'm increasing counterclockwise. Does that make sense? There's another um, thing in an enclosed region. A lot of textbooks will tell you there is actually a rule when a region is enclosed. This is, this is not important right now, because you'd be told this. I have some you know, crazy enclosed region. How do I know which way I'm going? Well, use the angle argument. Am I going to go clockwise or counterclockwise if I'm thinking angles? Counter. Counter. I learned this in grad school. They said, no, the orientation we base everything in math is the region should always be on your left. Does that make sense? Oh, so if my region's on my right, that changes the sign. It means I'm going in the opposite direction. It's not going to be a big deal right now, but this is how problems are generally oriented. So here's the question that I want. Let's say f of x, y, let's keep this really simple. f of x, y is going to be um, sine x, cos x. That's my f of x, y. And so we want to do the following three integrals. I want to do all three of these. Okay, 
So that means I need to do three completely separate problems because my parameterization, although the parameterization is pretty straightforward. Now this goes back to calc two. Whenever you're doing a circle centered at the origin, your parameterization, in fact, even uh, if you did ellipses centered at the origin, you did the same thing. You said X was cos t, Y was sine t. Remember doing that kind of stuff? This is a circle of radius four. So what parameterization should I use? Think polar for a second when you say r cos theta. So how about 4 cos t? This is not polar. We're not going polar here. Because I the reason we're not going polar is I only want one variable, t. So this would be 4 sine t, and t will range from what to what? 0, 0 to pi, because I just said tau hat. I am going to use this parameterization for all three. So to make my life easier, I know what dx dt is, but I want to write it in this form. I want to write dx equals and dy equals, because that's what I'm going to substitute within the integral itself. Or you can say dx dt. It, it really doesn't matter which way you go. So dx would be what? Negative 4 sine t integrated with respect to t. dy dt would be 4 cos t integrated with respect to t. And then lastly, dx dt squared plus dy dt squared under the square root, that's ds by the way. Ah, what would that be? That would be, sorry, here, 16 sine squared t plus 16 cos squared t, and then there would be a dt at the end. So there should be a, a dt right here. What's this? Four. Four. Four dt. I'm happy with this one. And pretty much rule of thumb, unless you're moving in a circle, this is usually not your friend. So we don't spend a lot of time on this one because the, you may come up with an integral that's kind of nasty. If I gave you a, something as simple as a parabola or a cubic or something like that, when you do that, you're going to get something that probably can't be integrated, or you're going to have to do some clever Calc 2 you know, trig substitution or something. No, no, we're not going to go there. We, we kind of missed the point of all this if we start making the integrations too complicated. I've got all my preliminary work. Uh, how did you get the x and y equations? This? Yeah. Because I'm on a circle. This is how this is this is my, my path as I'm moving on the top half of the circle. Oh, okay. So this is always the parameterization for a circle. And now here's what I want to do. I want to do this. Okay? So what I'm gonna do is convert this to T's. So what are my limits of integration that we just said? Zero to pi. Oh, you know what? I just realized something. I'm, my, my bad. I, I, just, I just realized something. I don't want to go sine, sine cosine. I'm sorry. I was thinking of my circle. I want to go x, y. <laughs> I'm just looking at it going, wait a minute. No, 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 no. That's too easy. I didn't have any y's in there. Sorry about that. We're going to go x, y, not sine cosine. This is where the sine cosine is coming in. Sorry, let me try that again. Oy. I need stronger coffee in the morning. There we go. So this is going to be 0 to pi. x is 4 cos times 4 sine. Yeah, you wouldn't have known that I wrote something completely insane there until we started doing the problem. And you're just like, this is not working very well. 4 sine t and dt. Can I do that integral? Is that gnarly or is that simple? One of the others, only between in this case. What do you think? Probably simple. Probably simple u sub or something like that. So I'm going to get a negative 64, and I'm going to get a, I'm going to write it as cos squared, oops, cos squared t sine t dt. So if my u is cosine, then what's my du? Cos cosine squared. Inside of squared. Did I? Oh, sorry. Sorry. Oh, boy. I can't even read this. 
That's right. So if my u is sine t, then what's my du? If my u is sine t, then my du is cos t, which is sitting right there. So can I integrate this as is? Sure. It's u squared. What's the antiderivative of u squared? D to the power of 3 over 3. Over 3. Ah, so I have over 3. So how about negative 64 thirds sine cubed? Hmm. What's that going to be? It's going to be zero because sine of pi and sine of zero are both zero. Ooh. So does that mean they're all going to be zero? No. 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 No, probably that's the only one. But I got zero. Hmm. Let's do x, y, dy. So everything is exactly the same except for this piece. Oh, that, yeah, okay, that's going to change things, isn't it? So I've got 4 cos t, 4 sine t, and then the dy is 4 cos t. dt, and that's 64 times cos squared t sine t dt. There we go. So this time, if my u is cosine, what's my u? Negative sign, so I need a negative for my chain rule factor. So what, what must I do? Yeah, I got to put a negative here also. So now it's of the form u squared du, same antiderivative. Yeah, except this time my u is cosine. That matters. So this answer is going to be negative sixty-four thirds cos cubed from zero to five. Now, what's the cosine of pi? Negative one. I'm gonna write like this. So cosine of pi is negative one, I'm gonna cube it. What's cosine, excuse me, cosine of zero? One. one. That's not zero. That's negative two, isn't it? So this answer is positive 128 thirds. Ooh. Okay, that's not the same answer. Okay, it, they really, really shouldn't be the same answer. That would be odd. I don't think I'm that good that I could design a problem where it was the same answer. Now let's do the third case. I want to keep over here with these guys. So the third case. So now I'm going to use this. Okay. I have four cos. Or sine 4. And that's 64 from 0 to pi of cos t sine t. Either one of them could be the u. Which one would you probably choose? Sine. Probably the sine because then I have to worry about the plus or minus. You agree? Might be. Yeah, it, it doesn't matter, but if I pick sine as my u, then my du is cosine. I don't have to worry about SIGNs. u to the first power, so the antiderivative would be u, half of u squared. So this would be 32 sine squared t from 0 to pi, which once again would be 0. Oh, interesting. It's not the answer that's important. It's the path that we had to take. So a line integral, again, you're given a well-defined curve. Now, the curve can be closed. There's nothing wrong with closing the curve. More often than not, though, the curve's not going to be closed. It's just going to be from point A to point B. OK, great. But then what we do is we integrate this way. So let's, let's look at another one. OK, I'm going to up the level of complexity. So let's, let's do a what if. I want to do, yeah, I'll keep this relatively simple. I want to do, let's say, x squared y dx. And the path is 0, 0 to how about um, 2, 4 along y equals x squared 
then two four to how about four eight along y equals two x. Ooh, I really made this one weird, didn't I? I gave you two paths. When you have multiple paths, which is actually very common, when you have multiple paths, there cannot be a gap because there would be nothing to integrate. It has to be one continuous piece. So what do you think I'm going to need to do? And we got a suggestion? I know you've not done this before. What seems logical to you? Yeah, I'm going to do that problem. I'm going to do that problem. If the final answer is work, then does it make sense that I'm calculating the work to get done along the first curve and then adding it to the work that gets done along the second curve? That should make some sense. But that's also why there cannot be a gap, because I want you to move from here to there and then pick up again somewhere else. Well, yeah, that, that's really kind of artificial in that case. So we look at it like this. <coughs> We're going to call this C1. We're going to call this C2. So what this actually becomes is this. This is the proper notation. We're going to do the union of the curves, which as Zachary just pointed out, would then be the sum of the intervals. And hopefully that makes sense. Hopefully that's logical. That's what your brain sends you. Go, okay, yeah, that, that seems like the most reasonable thing to do. So that's the problem I'm going to do. So I'm going to treat this as two completely unrelated different problems and do each one from start to finish. There's, there's no other way. I'm not going to try to squish them together. In fact, I can't put them into one simple integral for the simple reason that each one's going to have different limits of integration and each one's going to have a different integrand because I'm going to have different parameterizations. If I could write this as one integral, I would. Trust me, you know me, I'm lazy. It's not possible to write it as one integral. Again, you have different limits for both, and you also have different parameterizations. So let's, let's say along C1. Along y equal x squared, do you want to pick x to be your t, or y to be your t, or does it matter? Does it matter? No, cannot matter. So which one are you gonna choose? x, because if I choose y to be my t, then I gotta turn around and solve x in terms of y, and that's just, yeah, I'm, I'm too lazy for that. Do you all agree with that? By the way, you could go either way, but the other thing is if you pick x equals square root of y, now you're gonna do integrations potentially with square roots, and all of a sudden you're going, yeah, yeah, yeah I don't wanna do that. So I would probably say, let x equal t, y therefore is t squared. I don't have a dy in this problem. I only have a dx. That makes it easy. So dx is 1 dt. Agreed? OK. And what is the range of values for t? 0 to 2. 0 to 2 because t is representing the x. That's very, very important. So along c1, x squared y dx is. Zero to two of what? T squared times T squared. So the, just uh, this is for the first equation of the bottom. This, is, for this, bottom. Yeah. this right. is, in fact, let's do this. Let's call that. I called C1 the, the movement along the parabola. I called C2 the movement along the line. I mean, anything else would seem kind of odd, right? Yeah, why does the first generic equation have an x squared? x squared y? Because like I'm asking you to calculate this problem. This is my f of xy right here. Oh, okay. The f of xy has nothing to do with the path. It always have to be xy. No, it, it could be anything. 
We just, I just made up something. That problem I made at x times y. Oh. Yeah, it, I'm, I'm keeping that simple for now. <laughs> Will that always be simple? Oh, no, 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 no. It's going to get icky really fast, like, like in five more minutes. But right now, I'm, I'm integrating f of xy. Now I'm doing it along two paths. That's the big difference between the last problem and this problem. So where are we now? So now I'm going to replace x with t and y with t squared. Therefore, what will my integrand be? T to the fourth power. Everybody see that one? All right. It's t squared times t squared. That's going to be t to the fourth dt. Well, that's easy enough. So one fifth t to the fifth from zero to two. That's 32 over five. Beautiful. Okay. All right. That's half of my answer. Then the second half of the answer. Now, on y equal 2x, once again, it does not matter which variable I choose to be my, my t. But because y is already in terms of x, it just makes more sense to choose x as your t. Then you don't have to do anything. Right? You don't have to think about it. So again, we'll let x equal t, and then what's y? 2t. 2t. OK, beautiful. And then my dx is, again, just 1 dt. That worked out nice. And what is the range of values now? is between two and, four. two and four. I'm going to get a different integrand than the first half, and I'm going to get different moments of integration. That's why you couldn't write it as one integral. So along the path C2, we're going to have the integral from two to four. Now, t squared times T squared times what? T squared times 2t. Two t. OK, so that one's going to be t squared times 2t. So that's 2t cubed. OK, and that will be 1 half t to the fourth from 2 to 4. And it should be what, 1 half of 256 minus 16 or 120, OK? So what is the answer to this problem right here? This is equal to what? 120 plus 32 over 5. Exactly. And what's that? 632 over 5. So I just add them. I don't, I don't try to interpret what it means. I just, I just calculate them and add them, OK? No units right now, because we're not, we're not, we don't have any units, we don't have any length units, any force units, so that's it. But understanding, it's essentially saying, how much work did I get done doing all of this? That's kind of what we're asking, okay? You don't see a force vector up there, do you? You don't see one yet. You're gonna see it tomorrow. I'm, when I, I'm gonna do the same sorts of things tomorrow, but you're gonna see where the force vector actually it's hiding in the problem, just so you know. There is actually a force vector somewhere in the problem. I don't see a vector. No, you don't. But you might be seeing the components of the vector. That's, the, that's really what it comes down to. All right? So that wasn't too terrible. If somebody walked in and saw that, is that kind of intimidating? You see a single integral with more than one variable. Does that look weird to you at all? I mean, it... it, it would have a while ago until now you know what it actually means. You know, oh, okay, that's not that bad. Um, there's another symbol that we're going to introduce, and I'm going to write it right now, in fact. And I always love when people look ahead. I always tell calculus students, never look ahead. You're starting Calc 1 never having had calculus, and then you look ahead and you see the integral symbol, and it terrifies you. And then you learn integration, oh, okay. Then you Calc 3, and you see partial derivatives, it terrifies you, and now you do partial derivatives, and you go, oh. So now you're looking ahead a couple days and you see integrals with little circles up there. Oh my god, they're redoing integration. What does that mean? Does anybody know? That means your path is a closed loop. Oh, that just means that I did this. <laughs> That's all that means. It doesn't change the way you do the problem. It means you're looking for certain things. That just means my path is going to be a closed loop. 
so I need to give you what the path is, but, but you know now it's a closed loop. I don't have to say it's a closed loop. Oh, okay. Could I write it without the circle and it be a closed loop? Eh, you wouldn't do that because if you wrote it without the circle, you're kind of saying it isn't closed. So you, you want to always make that clear. That's all that symbol means. I'm doing the same problem over a loop. So if this were the problem, then I would just have added one more piece. That's it. No, oh, right, that's, that's not that big a deal, is it? All right, so let's do another scary, nasty. Let's do, let's see, let's make our path. Again, I want to keep this really simple. Let's say we're on, we're going from 0, 0 to 6, 0. To how about not, sorry, not six. Um, it was really easy. Two, nine, six, two. Let's see. Uh, I'm down. Hold on. So nine, six, two, nine, three. There we go. I'm going to just simply go from point to point to point linearly. We're going to do this one linearly. So just little line segments. Okay? I haven't told you what we're integrating yet, but. So what does this look like? I'm going from 0, 0 to 6, 0. And then I'm going from 6, 0 to. Nine six, and then I'm going from nine six to nine three. By the way, linear paths are nice because they're you know you can't really mess them up all that bad. Yeah, here's what we're going to integrate. We're going to integrate um, how about x plus two y dx. Plus, how about x squared minus y squared dy? Hmm. Did this just get really wonky? Yeah. What does that mean? Well, think of this as I just added two integrals. I added the integral where you were doing the dx, and then I added the integral where you were doing the dy. I said, well, then why didn't I write it just two separate problems? Because I'm only giving you the one overall path. Oh, so I'm doing all of this over this path, and at the same time doing all of this over this path. So might as well just do them at the same time. This is actually the way most line integrals look. And if I'm moving in 3D, then what? Plus a dz, yeah, and that's actually the most common one. Oh, so I'm moving through three space, but I have forces applied in each direction. So I'm giving you a hint. The stuff in the x direction is the x part of the force. The stuff in the dy is the y part of the force. Oh, okay. So is this complicated? No, but how many integrations must I perform here? It's not based on that. It's based on that. How many integrals do you take? Three, because I have three different paths, that's why. So what we do is, let me put the C. And then we say C is equal to C1 union C2 union C3, where we will call this path C1, this path C2, this path C3. Just keep it easier. There's really no reason to, to, to change that. That's fairly simple. Now, I gave you stuff that was pretty simple to use. There is a tricky part of this, though. There is one tricky part. That last path is a little bit tricky. Do we know why the last path is a little bit tricky? Well, that's horizontal, so it's not vertical. It's coming, it's coming back. I like that. It's coming back. Oh, I'm going forward. I'm going forward. And I didn't go up. I, 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 I kind of came back. So in other words, my y's are going from 6 to 3. They're going backwards, aren't they? So we're going to figure out how to write that. It's actually pretty simple. 
A lot of textbooks make that piece really, really complicated and have you write functions a certain way that's correct, but it's overkill. It, that one shouldn't be complicated. So let's start along path C1. What is the equation of this line? It's y equals zero. So along the line y equals zero, then do you want to pick your, well, what about x? What's x then? x is changing. So x has to be t, y has to be zero. x is not zero. <laughs> Would you agree that x is changing? Oh, okay. That's definitely the case. So what is dx? It'd be one dt. What's dy? Zero dt. And t is ranging from what to what? Zero to six. Zero to six. When you first looked at that, that looked like it could be complicated. Actually, it's the least complicated because you've got, you know, not a lot going on. You get some zeros in there somewhere. So everywhere you see a y, everywhere you see a dy, you're going to have some zeros. So my integral for this one will be the integral from 0 to 6. Now, I've got to do everything right. x is t, y is 0, and dt, excuse me, dx is just 1 dt. But because dy is 0 dt, that part's going to go away, isn't it? So what do I have left? Just, just T D T. Everybody agree with that? That's all I have left. Everything else disappeared. Well, that's pretty nice. So it's one half T squared from zero to six. T. You. Well, that was easy enough. Okay. The next one, I'm going to be moving along that diagonal line. So along C two, what parameterization would you like to use? Well, I kind of need the equation of the line, don't I? Ooh, how am I going to do that? Point slope formula. Well, what's the slope of that line? So the slope is 2. So this line here is what? y equals 2x minus what? Well, it's easy. When x is... When x is 9, y's got to be 6, so it's got to be 18 minus 12, right? I'm being really lazy. Yeah, I do use the point slope formula when necessary. I didn't really need it right there. Real quick check. When x is 6, y is 0. Okay, good. I did it right. So what parameterization would you like? Well, again, probably let x equal t. That's kind of the most common one. And then what would y be? 2t minus 12. Okay. So my dx is 1 dt. My dy is 2 dt. And t will range from x is t. So t is going to range from what to what? 6 to 9. 6 to 9. Beautiful. Okay. And so now we get the integral from 6 to 9. Now, be careful. Let's go slow. x is t, y is 2t minus 12. So I'm going to put and write it out. So I'm going to have t plus 2 times 2t minus 12. And then what's the second part? t squared minus y squared, so minus the square of 2t minus 12, and all of it is dt. I don't need, I don't, I'm not going to write dt in the middle and then dt at the end, it's all dt. Should I lose one? Should we multiply by 2 for the second? Oh, thank you, Zachary. Times, thank you, Zachary. Good, good, good catch. I'll put the 2 right there. How's that? Yes. Zachary's correct. I'm going to lose that guy. Now, is that messy? Yeah, let's do that off to the side. I, I can't stand going integral equals integral equals integral equals integral while I'm doing all of my algebra to simplify the integrand. <laughs> I'm not doing any calculus while I'm simplifying the integrand. So I'm a big fan of 
simplify your integrand off to the side. So the next thing you write is the simplified integrand. So what have we got on top? Or right, first we have t plus 4t minus 24 plus 2t squared minus, now I'm going to square this times 2. So 4t squared minus, so minus 8t squared, then minus 24t, so plus 48t, then plus 144, so minus, minus 288. And what is all that? That's going to be negative 6t squared, 5t, that's 53t, and then what? Negative, negative, so it would be minus 312. All right, so this is, we're going to need our calculators in a minute. Yeah, there was some algebra involved, unavoidable. Oh, you know what? I yeah, that should be a 90. I forgot to multiply by 2, didn't I? Good. That's a 90, 60. Yikes. So that's what? 101 T. Glad we caught that. I caught it right, right then and there. Did I do that on the other one too? 144 times 2. No, I got that one right. 14 squared 18. Okay. That should be 101. All right, so let's integrate this. So negative 2 T cubed plus 101 halves T squared minus 312 T. All right, get out your calculator. I mean, your answer is going to be halves, so this shouldn't be that bad. I don't know, calculator? I never do. All right. Take a moment. Let's calculate that. Uh, so for C1, why was it T dt again, the integral? Oh, because over here, what, what parameterization did we use? X is T, Y is 0. So that's 0 and that's 0. DX was dt. The dy was 0 dt. So the only thing left was just the x and the dx. Oh, OK. Because okay. all the zeros. Okay. We, we, that's why I said you actually like the horizontal and vertical lines, because it produces all sorts of zeros. All right, let's, let's all do this. I like everybody that hopefully two people give me the same numerical value. It's always a good thing. Does anybody else get that? I'll write that down. A whole group of people with calculators. <laughs> Nobody ever wants to. <laughs> Did anybody else get it? Did you get that in a second? You got something else, obviously. There's something very different. Way different? What'd you get? I got 621.22. You also have the same thing? All right, I tend to. <clears throat> Again, because we're finding them independently when people agree. Did anyone else get it? Or you got it? I got that. You got that? Okay, that's three. So either they're completely crazy or you have telepathy and you say, use my bad answer. I'm, I'm, I'm saying that's probably right then. Again, I, I don't say that jokingly. You're, you're finding them independently. The chances of you getting the exact same wrong answer, pretty unlikely. So I'm going with that one. Now, icky, sure, doesn't matter. Now, this is the one that will give us the most trouble, the C3. So how do I set up the C3? I'll do this one over here. Well, let's go through our parameterization. This time, this is the vertical line x equals 9. Okay, It's the vertical line x equals 9. So x is 9. <laughs> but y is changing. Therefore, what should I choose for y? Y is t. 
That is not always obvious. I would hope that's obvious. On the first one, we were on the line y equals zero. That's why y was zero, because we're on that line. Now we're on the line x equals nine. That's why we choose x to be nine. Okay, so dx is zero dt. dy is one dt. And the value of t is ranging from what to what? T's are between three and six. Most textbooks <clears throat> would have you make the y way more complicated so that when t is three, I would be up here, and then when t is um, six, I would be down here and have it moved. So instead of being t, they'd have you do it as nine minus t, which is correct, by the way. But man, it gets kind of confusing if you have to start rewriting. I'm gonna show you how, how you can fix this easily. This is not complicated. So, let me write it right here. I know I don't have paint erasing stuff, but we have that answer. So my integration is going to be nine plus two t times zero dt. So that's gone. Nine squared minus t squared. One dt. That's so <laughs> I just reverse the order of integration because I am starting at six and I'm ending up at three. I, by the way, you, some of you are going, you mean really is that easy? Every textbook I've ever seen will say, no, 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 you can't do this. You've got to make it nine minus e. You've got to make it three to six and then you've got to, no, that's just, it's too complicated, too much thinking. No, do everything regardless of direction, set this problem up and you're starting here ending here, that's it. You're gonna go from six to three. I don't know if this answer is positive or negative, but I do know I want these guys reversed because I started here and ended here. That's why the arrows are actually important, that we don't, we don't ignore them, okay? So what will this be? Okay, you got your calculators. Positive 180? Oh, wait. I thought it was going to be 6. Is it going to 6 to 8? Yeah, because yeah, yeah, you're starting here and you're ending here. Oh, because oh, you. So no. evaluate the whole thing at 3 minus the whole thing at 6. Yeah. Right. right. Does negative, that change your answer? Negative 180. Negative 180. Ah, okay. And there's nothing wrong with that. Because I, I, I like what Zachary said, going backwards. Let me think of, let me do another thing. What if, I'm not going to, but what if we then decide to go all the way back to the beginning? It would seem reasonable that when I'm going, if I'm going forward and getting positive numbers, doesn't it seem reasonable that if I'm going backwards, I ought to get negative numbers? And if for some reason, this isn't, but for some reason, if this was a conservative force, then at the end, I should, everything should add up to zero. Oh, then that means that some of them should have been positive and definitely some of them would have had to have been negative to do that. So when I'm going backwards, if you will, like I did here, a negative result seems reasonable. So now what is the answer? It is 18 plus 621 over two minus 180. And what does that give us? 297. 297 over two. We're not gonna to try to read anything into it. That's, that's our fine line, so that's, that's a version of work. Okay, is that cool that? So a couple of different things now that you've seen. I can have multiple paths and then I just add up the results of the multiple paths. And within my integration, I can have dx's and dy's within the integration at the same time. Okay, totally acceptable. All right. Do one more of these. <clears throat> I, I, I don't want this to be complicated at all. Let's say I have
Okay. I'm going to do, sorry, I'm going to make that X, Y. Sorry. I want to more fun. There we go. I'm going to make that X, Y. Just more interesting now. Um, where am I starting? The answer is yes. I want you to calculate the perimeter of the floor. So I'm going to start there, but Zachary, just maybe you start over there. And Captain, you start over in that corner. And um, Oliver, you start with that corner. Will we all get the same answer? As long as we end up where we started. Get my point? You have a closed loop, doesn't matter where you start. Just end where you started. Oh, so what is the most logical starting place? Yeah. Oh, the origin, yeah, you don't have to think about it that way. But start at the origin, because then it just makes it easier, but it actually doesn't matter. What you probably wouldn't do is say, well, let me just pick an arbitrary point somewhere along here. <laughs> that's, that's way too much thinking. So I'm going to have to add two things together, two different parameterizations. And I'm not going to do this problem any different than I did the previous problem. I'm going to take two things and add them up. The fact that it's a closed loop does not have any effect on how you approach it. Okay, make sure I want you to understand that. It will not affect your approach in any way. So if we're doing the first one, So just if we're going to start at the origin, then we probably are going to call that C1 and that C2. So C1, what parameterization is probably the most logical? What do I want my T to be? Because it's Y equals X squared. Usually if one variable is described in terms of the other, the complicated one make that T and then the first variable is easy. I could certainly say, well, let's call it x square root of y. There's nothing wrong with that. But then I have to rewrite it, have square roots, and most of you say I'd rather not do the root. There's some icky stuff potentially. So I'm going to say let x equal t, and y is t squared. My dx is 1 dt. And the reason I write the 1, I know it seems redundant, it's reminding myself that I actually took the derivative. Because <laughs> then the dy is 2t dt. And what will the range of values of t be? Zero, one. Zero, one. Yeah, that's easy enough. So that first integral, okay, is going to be what? And again, my c, of course, is the union of c1 and c2. So this first integral is going to be 0 to 1. Now, be very careful when you're substituting. 4x squared dx. So that would be 4t squared times 1. I'm going to write times 1. I'm going to put the dt at the end. I don't want to put dt twice, and then I have to rewrite it. That's too much work. I'm too lazy. Minus 3t times t squared times 2t. So I have minus 3t times t squared times 2t. Everybody see that? That's what the second term is going to be. And what's that? Minus 6t to the fourth, and then the whole thing is dt. Since you're changing everything to t's, you only need to write the dt once at the end. You don't need to write twice. So, 4t squared, 4 thirds t cubed, minus 6 fifths t to the fifth from 0 to 1, so I get 4 thirds minus 6 fifths is 2 fifteenths. Okay? Or 15. Do you think when you come back, it's going to cancel out and give you zero? I think so. What'd you say? Maybe. Yeah, that's probably a better answer. <laughs> it might. It might not. Oh. In other words, it does not have to. In fact, Usually it won't. It might. But it, there's no guarantee. So if you don't get negative two fifths, two fifteenths in reverse, don't assume you did it wrong. The only way it can cancel out is if the original 
force that I don't even know what it is yet, by the way. There is a force somewhere in the world. It's, it's hiding up there. If that original force was conservative, then I'd get zero. I don't even know what that original force is. I don't even know how to find it yet. You have to come tomorrow to learn how to find it. Just, just say it. <laughs> okay. So now on the way back, on C2, huh, might you change your parameterization? Could I rewrite that as y equals square root of x? Absolutely. But then when I do my dx and dy, I'm going to have a root, and then I've got to take a derivative, and it, it, yeah. do you agree it can get a little bit on the icky side? So what would be a better choice this time? Y is t. I will let y equal t, because x is described in terms of y. And then x would be my dt. Or sorry, uh, sorry, my t squared. Oh, then dy is 1 dt, and dx is 2 t dt. And t will again range from 0 to 1, except when I write my integral, I will reverse the order of integration to indicate that I'm going backwards, if you will. I'm not starting at 0 and ending at 1. I'm starting at 1 and ending at 0. Okay. Part of the reason I would much rather do it that way is, once again, this would be a more complicated parameterization. You would have said, let y equal 1 minus t, and then x squared is the square of 1 minus t, and now my chain rule factors start getting kind of kind of nasty, right? No, the way you do it is do it like this. So what is the integration I'm going to? This is the old problem. So my integration is going to be, well, let's see. When I go back to here, I have 4 t squared squared. In fact, it's going to be 4 t squared squared and then times 2t because my dx is 2t dt, correct? So that's going to be what? 8t to the fifth? Oh, that's the one we might mess up if we're not careful. Minus 3 times x times y squared, so minus 3 times t squared times y squared times 1 dt, that would be minus 3t to the fourth, then the whole thing could be t. And then I'm going from 1 to 0. 3xy, not 3xy squared. Did I? Oh, hold on. Yeah, so Did so that right? yeah. Thank you. Oh, okay, that's, so that's cubed. Did I lose it? I didn't lose it. Thank you, Sam. I read my writing from here. Is that all right? So let's calculate this one. That, this is the key right here. So this would be 4 thirds t to the 6th minus 3 fourths t to the 4th from, uh, from 1 to 0, which if you want to think of it like maybe do this. Hmm. What am I doing with these answers? I'm adding them. So when I add the answers, hmm, what's interesting about this answer? It's not negative. It's negative. <laughs> interesting. How could it possibly be negative? Now remember my wheelbarrow example. Ooh. Maybe I was losing stuff on the way back. You know, so I did less work on the way back, or I was gaining stuff. I did more work on the way back. You know, there's, there's a lot of ways you could look at that. So what, what's our final answer? Negative 920. Negative 920s. Is it possible? Well, all things are like it. There are no rules here. We love it when it's zero. Never assume it's going to be zero. In fact, Arguably, pe people will say, if fundamental theorem of calculus is 1A, then Green's theorem would be 1B. It's considered, if not the most, it's the second most important theorem and result in all of calculus. And Green's theorem is specifically designed for problems of this nature, because they're usually not zero. If they are, we rejoice, but we have no control over that. You understand? It either is or it isn't based on the original problem. I can't tweak the problem to make it work. So we're going to look in general. Everything we did was true and correct. This wasn't that complicated. 
Could it be more complicated? Could my integrations get more difficult? Could I have a nasty? Could we make this a lot nastier? Oh, it's not right. Throw some trig or exponentials. We all see we could make it much nastier. Hmm. What else could I do? I could have more paths. But the thing, Green's theorem is how do I address the situation where it's closed? And we look at it from a very different point of view. And it absolutely always makes the problem significantly easier. The, the way we're going to look at it, but it has to be a closed path. What if it's conservative? Well, we'll still get an answer of zero, but we're rarely going to actually work with a conservative force in that case. Okay? Any questions so far? This is kind of, kind of heady stuff, isn't it? Yes? Do conservative paths have to end where they start? No, no. Conservative force, closed path, unrelated. So okay. the, this, the stuff up here, we're going to learn tomorrow how to determine whether it's conservative or not. Whether this is conservative or not has nothing to do with the path I'm on. So the circle meant my path was closed. What if I did, let me, let me tweak this slightly. I'm going to take this guy out of there. I no longer am interested in coming back home. I'm going on vacation and then I'm staying. So what am I going to do now? I'm just going to erase that. And I'm not going to bother calling that C1. It's just C. So now I'm back to just C. OK? But the path and the force, have they're unrelated. I'm going to give you a force. Right? I'm going to give you a wheelbarrow full of stuff. You now know what force you have to apply. But I can say, OK, I want you to go over there. I want you to go over there. I want you to go over there. Does that make sense? Oh, all of those are different paths. OK? So the idea being, Right now, we don't know where the force is coming from, but we, we suspect somewhere in the integrand, the force is hidden in there. It is. In fact, next day's lecture is going to be absolutely obvious, but there's a whole bunch of stuff we have to do first. If I asked you what is the force that I'm applying, you would all be able to tell me almost instantly. That, that doesn't involve integration, to tell me where the force is, and then to tell me, well, how is it that we're getting work when we're doing an integration of something? But that's part of what tomorrow's lecture is is uh, the title, I think, or at least in the videos, I think it's um, Nine Integrals as Work. No, I did no, talk about my schedule. It's, we're introducing line integrals today. We're now going to see very specifically how they're related to work. And we're going to see there's multiple forms. And that's really important that we recognize there's multiple forms. Have we dealt with things previously with vectors where there were multiple forms of saying the exact same thing? Give, for example, speed and arc length. Ah, magnitude of the velocity, remember? That was speed, but it was also the same as the arc length. So we sometimes called it magnitude of velocity, sometimes we called it DSDT. It was a context thing, whatever was easier to use at the time. We're going to be doing similar stuff now. We're going to have integrals of a certain form where we might write it in a completely different form because that form will be easier for us to analyze. Right now I'm taking stuff like this and I'm changing it into this which is much easier. Is there any reason why I can't do this problem as is? Well, I might be able to do that problem. There might be another way of looking at it. But the parameterization is usually the easiest way to go about this. And I'm doing paths in two dimensions. But then later, we're going to do paths in three dimensions. And we're going to do closed loops in three dimensions. We're going to do everything you could possibly imagine. And we're going to be able to set up the problem. One thing I will promise you is the integrations in general will not be complicated things. You're not going to be having to pull out all of your Calc 2 techniques, in other words. You're not going to do your integration by parts or partial fractions or you know, trig subs to do these. It can happen, but the Calc, the Calc 3 courses tend to stay away from those because you're learning all these new concepts. Right? We, don't want, we don't want you to stall with the actual antiderivatives. So those are generally going to be simple things to do. Now, where we are having a little bit of issues right now is on substitution. I'm seeing some pretty crazy stuff, but having taught calculus for a million years, I always see crazy stuff. But I have to remind people, some, some folks forget what are the rules when you're doing a u sub. There are absolute rules that cannot be violated, and people violate them all the time, which means on most integrals, some of us are giving two or three completely different numerical answers to the exact same question. You, you know, can't do that. I had a student many years ago, this guy cracked me up. You guys remember Happy Days? Remember that show? Remember the Fonz? We know who the Fonz is. He was like the most iconic television character, literally of the decade of the 70s. He was the cool guy, you know, slicked back hair, motorcycle jacket. 
It was a silly show. I taught this student a number of years ago. I swear this guy must have memorized that show because that's exactly his look in the leather jacket, the, the, the coif hair and all this. But he was in a Calc 1 class and somewhere along the line he, he had learned some tricks to get credit for everything. So every calculus question that was asked, he gave four answers to every question. I'm not joking. He said the answer 0, 1, infinity, D and E. And he put all four to every question that was asked for the first several weeks. And I'd mark him wrong. And he'd get all upset. Because the answer usually was one of those. And he didn't understand why he wouldn't get credit because I have a right answer. I said, no, you have three wrong answers. I go, when you fill out a multiple choice, do you fill in all the bubbles? He goes, always. Because then I can argue that I have the right answer. I'm like, oh my God, the guy went on for a while. He eventually finally figured it out that this isn't going to work. Anymore. And he'd stomp his feet and he'd yell real loud. And he'd sit there and go, does that actually work? He goes, yeah, actually sometimes it does. And when he finally realized this wasn't going to work, he started doing calculus. He ended up being really good and doing well in the rest of the courses. But he gave four answers to every question. I just thought that was hysterical. And he said that usually worked in his previous courses. Well, you can't give more than one answer to a numerical value. So I just wanted to remind us, something really, really, I'm gonna do something really simple. I have the integral from, let's say, zero to one of four x cubed minus one, and I'll, I'll, I'll put the chain rule factor right here, just to make it real easy. Okay, um, let's say to the third power, okay. Well, nobody in the right line is gonna multiply this out. Agreed? We're all gonna use a substitution because it's easier. So we probably all say let u equal 4x cubed minus 1, because that's the argument, not the exponent. And then my du would be 12x squared dx. And now I'm going to write that as this, right? I'm reading from my left eye, but it's usually an indication. No, it won't matter what I write next, because this is completely garbage, and I just totally ruined calculus for all future generations. But a lot of us are doing this. There's an absolute unyielding thing is if you're going to change the variable in a definite integral, you can't leave the old limits. The answer to this question is one fourth. <laughs> you can't get another answer to this question. But the answer to this question is not one fourth. So some of us are writing this and then saying, and it equals another answer. There's a second unaltering thing. In a definite integral, if you make a substitution, you never go back. You can't. There is no path back. You guys have been doing polar for a little while now, haven't you? And you change your integral to polar. How many of the end of the integral changed it back to rectangular? No, you haven't. But that's what you're saying. You cannot change. Only an indefinite integral gets changed back because you have to give an answer that's a function. So you have one of two recourses here, and it ain't this. You either, in Calc 1, you learn two ways of doing it. You did the general antiderivative, and I say off to the side. Okay, then with that substitution, this is u cubed du, which is 1 fourth u to the fourth plus c, which is 1 fourth 4x cubed minus 1 to the fourth plus c. Aha! Now I can say this is 1 fourth. 4x cubed minus 1 to the 4th from 0 to 1. And that would be correct, because I don't need the plus c in the definite. That is correct. Or you say, well, if I'm changing it to this, then when x is ranging from 0 to 1, when x is 0, u is negative 1. When x is 1, u is 3. Then I'm writing this as negative 1 to 3 of u cubed du. It's this or it's this. There isn't a third, and if you were shown something different, it really, really would scare me badly. Because there isn't another way. This is 400 years old, it hasn't changed at all. No part of this has ever deviated in any century. You either do the general antiderivative and take the result, or you change the variable. I could care less. Changing the variable is more efficient. Are there times you don't want to change the variable? Think Calc 2 for a moment. Remember when you did improper integrals, integrals with infinite limits of integration? Or you did trig subs of definite integrals? <sighs> to keep track of the variable changes, and those I would say, no, no, do the general antiderivative <laughs> off to the side and come back. Because you were taking the limits of your limits. That can get really complicated, can't it? 
it was always legal to do this. You were shown, you were shown this to show that's the fastest way to get through the problem. It's exactly 50% of the steps. Exactly 50% of the steps, but if you're not getting it right, then do this. But what you cannot do, there's two things that people do. They write this with the old limits, which is completely wrong. Doesn't matter what they write after that. Then they calculate that one. I'm, this is what I'm talking about. This is what I'm seeing a lot of. I'm seeing zero to one youth cubed du, which is one fourth u to the fourth from zero to one, and then changing it back to the other one. This is a number. This isn't a function, this is a number. This equals one fourth. One fourth doesn't equal another number, and as an absolute, you cannot change this variable. It's a definite integral. So don't do that. Stop doing that. In calc one, integration by substitution is probably the most important single concept we did because it's the chain rule in reverse. For derivatives, chain rule was the most important. For antiderivatives, sub, u sub is using the chain rule, so it's a higher level of reasoning. Then we get to definite integrals and you know, it throws a monkey wrench until we realize, oh, I can do this problem if I change the limits, or I can just be safe and do this. Some people are just always safe and do this. But in Calc 1, you had to choose one, you had to do it. But now you get to Calc 2 and you've done a bazillion use-ups. That's why some of the problems that we've done will say, well, if that's my U, there's my DU, and we just went ahead and integrated it. Because it's sitting there right in front of us. You can do that. We never did that in Calc 1 because we were still learning the process, correct? We were still learning how to do a U sub, so trying to do it in your head was probably not a great idea. But on this problem here, I would, I would do this. Even in Calc 3, I'd say, all right, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do my U substitution. This is U to the third DU, so the antiderivative is one fourth u to the fourth. This is what I do. Did I make the substitution? Yeah, I said in the air. I made it in the air. I said, let this be u, then there's my du, this is u to the third du, so the antiderivative is one fourth u to the fourth. I just didn't rewrite the problem multiple times because it's just sitting there right in front of us. Would you say that's a pretty simple one? Because it's right there. I didn't have to do any algebraic manipulation. I didn't have to do anything. In Calc 1, I would not have wanted you to do that. Because it relies too much on you doing all the math in your head. You want to leave a kind of a trail here. But in Calc 2 and 3, I actually encourage you to do that. Because now you understand. You really did do a U substitution. You just didn't necessarily rewrite everything. Okay? So you can always do that. And that's what I would actually prefer you to do, probably, because it's less likely. You see. When you're doing a double or a triple integral and there's a substitution involved, oh, keeping track of it can be ominous. And some of you, by the way, do a fantastic job of it. But let's face it, it can be difficult to keep track of everything because there's so much going on. So a lot of times doing the off to the side might be advisable. We did a crazy infinite one the other day, I said the statistics problem, right? Negative infinity to positive infinity and we had something and we also had to do a substitution and yikes. But we managed to get through it. Those are the ones that tend to be a little bit harder. But one thing we can't afford to do is make integration mistakes when the integration itself is not that complicated. Now, I, algebra errors are going to occur. I, I, don't, I don't worry about algebra errors. I mean, they, they happen. Right? And the question I get asked a lot is, how do I check my answer? Mm -hmm. If you're solving an equation, you can always check by substituting your solution back into the equation. But if I gave you an algebra class, here's a bunch of stuff simplified. OK, I've got to multiply things out, gather like terms. I whittle it down to something small. Is there any check? No, it does, there's no value. It's, all I can do is just go back through and proofread. I'm looking for typos when I go back through. You can't check a simplification. You just, you just have to be careful. So if this is a wrong numerical value in the end because of an arithmetic error, I can't really do much about it. I can live with that. But I can't really do anything, right? I can't really check it. That's the problem. And sometimes people go, well, let me go online and check it. Well, the problem is you might have done it right. We've all done this. We've done a check, and we messed up a check. I'm a big fan of checking. But have you ever messed up the check? And therefore, your perfect solution <laughs> just got erased because <laughs> you messed up the check. And that's where it's, that's the worst problem. You, you did a perfect problem. You checked it, but the check was complicated. And we messed up the check. 
Where some people say, I always check it online, but they're not careful when they check it online, they misentered it. And again, it fell apart. I'd say, I probably go with the original every time unless you, unless you spot the error, never, never change it. Unless you spot the error. So, oh, shoot, my, like Sam in the comment, I forgot to write the two, right? You caught the error. Otherwise, we get to the end of the problem, we don't know if we did it right or not. Yikes. Now, tomorrow, Wednesday, are the last things that we're going to do on the last exam. There's still material left, but they're the last things that will appear on exam three. The remaining stuff will just be on the last quizzes and then potentially on the final exam. Um, the next exam is going to be quite different from the other ones, though. In that, I'm actually, the next exam, because the problems themselves tend to be much bigger problems. They're, they're large scale things where, you know, before I said take the dot product of these two vectors on exam one. Right? That was like eight seconds long. Now every problem is kind of beefy. I call them all big ticket items. So this will be the first exam that you'll have in this course where I will actually give you more problems and you get to choose. Those in Calc 2, we had a lot of exams like that because in Calc 2, it is easy to design an exam where everything's roughly the same level of difficulty and the same amount of work. So then I can give you 20 questions and do 15 kind of thing in Calc 2. Calc 1, you really can't do it because some problems are really short, some are really long. So what I'll do in Calc 1 is I'll say, here's eight integrals, do six of them. Or here's you know, 10 derivatives, do five of them. But I can't make all the points the same because some problems were really short and sweet, some were really long. This is the only test this semester where I can actually make them all the same value because of the length in the size. So it means you're going to do far fewer problems and you'll actually have some choices. So I'll go over that a little bit later on, but just so you know. So a line integral, you're going to do a, a whole line integral from beginning to end. It will you know, probably look something like this problem did, you know, a couple of paths maybe. Maybe only one path with some, some normally parameterizations, I don't know. But no difficult integrations in general. Right, the integrations themselves are generally not going to be that bad. Is there going to be double integrals on this one, or are we triples only? Uh, I think the first section was, was uh, polar graphs, so there'll be double integrals. Yeah, in fact, um, going the rest of the way, it's really 50-50. Uh, surface area, for example, is always a double integral. And we're going to be doing things we're called surface integrals next week, which are double integrals. So it, it, it's probably 50-50. I'd say you're probably going to do more double integrals than triple, just because of the nature of things. Um, but this test, yeah, we'll start with the polar integrals and then, and then go from there. So if you're, if you're comfortable with integration, there's nothing we're going to run into where the integration itself should stump you. It's always about the setup. Okay? Uh, let's go ahead and stop.